It's all a matter of perception. Where we stand in space and time. There is no you or me that I can see. Only delusions of the mind. Hi, welcome to Soul Perspectives. I'm Kip. And I'm Evan. And we're here to share where we're at in space and time on what today? Well, it's Pride Month and it's uh, Pride Weekend in the Bay Area. So we are going to share our perspectives on LGBTQ. And it's about time someone did. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that's probably been around, oh, as long as humans. In fact, exists in other species. And <laughs> since there were penises and penises and vaginas and vaginas. <laughs> So good. So good. I, I feel like sexuality is, first of all, it's a biological imperative to procreate, to reproduce, to continue your line, right? And so it's something that exists no matter what. And it seems like those definite, infinitive, never goes away things tend to give us some of the biggest problems, some of the most challenges. There was a show on um, Showtime called Masters of Sex, it was about the Masters and Johnson sex days. And what struck me immediately when I started watching the show was, one, how juvenile our relationship to our physical connection to each other is, mm -hmm. and how we, even up till the 1950s, we were still, you know, barely whispering about it in stag films, and you got to go to the darkest part of town to find this. But what really struck me is, it's the 1950s, and that's the first legitimate study that Western culture did on sexuality. Probably the only one before that was probably the Karma Sutra. And we take for granted that, oh, this is just the way everyone's always related to sex. Well, I just posted up recently an article about how Native Americans recognized at least five different genders. Mm, there was no stigma around it at all. This is a really yeah. a Western culture phenomenon, it seems to me. Well, the, the gender one is an interesting because there's that biological gender that appears, and then there's the, the social gender, the identity gender, the, the holistic gender. And um, I think that it's pretty obvious that we all are complex beings and we have different traits and different emotions and we respond to our environment in different ways. And some of those have been labeled as masculine ways to respond to our environment, and some of those have been labeled feminine ways to respond to our environment, but they're so complex and nuanced and we all have all of them, right? If we all go, ooh, a baby, right? Are we still being the macho man? No, but do macho man go, ooh, a baby? Yes. So we're complex, nuanced beings with all of these things in us anyway, no matter what the biology shows. We're really talking about our place in society and how we relate. You know, our place in the tribe and community, how we relate. And I love that you used a Native American reference because in tribe, you just wanted to know who they were. Yeah. You just wanted to understand, oh, that's our, you know, level three gender person, you know, wh however they, they describe that. And, and that's okay. They just want to know. They just want to understand. We seem so hell-bent on, on judging it, mean, not just defining that's it, classifying it, it and, and, and knowing what it is. But we, we don't seek the deeper understanding before we've already summed it up as irrelevant or a jerk or evil or bad or... or or good. We spent a lot of time, I was talking with a, our, one of our friends yesterday, um, judging other people's happiness. Well, why are we doing that? I should be thrilled for someone's happiness. If you're not harming anyone and you're being positive in the world and whatever, and you're joyful and you're happy, why should I care at all what you do, no matter what it is, sexual or otherwise? Yet we do. We, we judge each other's happiness as if we have a better understanding of what it would take to be happy than, than, than that person themselves. It makes me see one, one little aspect that, that when we, if, if a, an LGBTQ identified person wears the rainbow and marches down Market Street on Pride Day and everything, that, that the case against that is, well, you're, now you're flaunting at my face. Do your thing, do it in your bedroom, just don't flaunt at my face, you know? And um, again, when you look at the Pride Parade and the joy, I mean, absolutely, they've made big points. Since this is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York, um, where, where gay men in a gay bar were, there, was, there were riots. They were beaten by the police for nothing other than being in a bar that was identified as a gay bar. So um, the fact that now Pride is such a celebration, it's evolved into more uh, of a celebration. And 
it's what you're saying. Like people are joyous and, and celebrating their lives and each other. And, and that's what's going to bother someone. Yeah. It, it really makes you want to just give a real check in to why do things bother us? <laughs> well, I also think it's worth making note of how far, well, I moved here in 85 and just how far things have come, it's worth noting. And it gives us so much hope for the future on everything. 85, middle of the AIDS uh, epidemic, um, people weren't open. We weren't talking about gay marriage except in hushed whispers a lot of times, if at all. And now we have not only a, our, is gay marriage acceptable and, and legal, but now we have people able to identify in, I don't know what, like literally 1,100 different genders on Facebook or something. Mm. It's, it's really remarkable. And I think that also tells me that when I see it's all people wanting to identify with so many different um, perspectives of their own gender, what the reflection they see of themselves in the mirror, and then also the people that want to download their consciousness and the singularity. What that tells me is we're gradually waking up to we're not these bodies. We're not these masks we wear. We've, we're, we've, hold on, we've held on to them really tightly and we've said, this is what I am. And if you tell me I'm something other than this or what society's told me I'm going to be, then, then there's something wrong. And now we're waking up. Maybe, that, maybe what we thought was true isn't true. Maybe and, we thought was real isn't real. And it's tricky and it's complicated and nuanced. And, and I feel pretty clear that sexuality exists on a continuum. And there, there is a level of, of okay, I, I am attracted to this and not attracted to that at all. I've tried it. I've been open. I haven't resisted it. I haven't judged it. I s sincerely experimented to find my truth and I know I'm here. How many people really do that, you know? And, and we've seen so many people transition on that continuum. Oh, I used to be this, now I'm this. Oh, I used to feel that way and I've opened and I've found, mm, I kind of like this, I didn't think I would, but I do. So us knowing ourselves are even, what's the true self and what's the self that we think we are? Right. There's that confusion too. But it, one thing I want to refer to here is a brilliant author named Leonard Schlein and he wrote a book, he wrote many brilliant books, but one of the books is called Leonardo's Brain and it's about the brain of Leonardo da Vinci and he feels quite strongly that Leonardo da Vinci was homosexual, likely left-handed but also ambidextrous and all these things that he could determine about his brain from the, the genius that he was. And what Schlein talks about in his book that just is, makes so much sense to me is about this nature's propensity towards the number 12 and how humans very, operate in, very often operate in groups of 12 or very near 12. But what we find in nature, what Schlein discovered is that in a group of 12, there will be certain conventions that exist. One in 12, 8% of the population. I always heard when I was growing up, 10% of the population LGBTQ. Um, but I, what Schlein says makes so much more sense. If you go out in a group of 12 men for a hunt in your tribe, one of those men, you're, and you're all, if you're all right-handed, you're all looking the same direction. What if the animal you're hunting comes from the other direction? No one's going to see it because no one is left-handed looking this way. That's why one in 12, 8% will be left-handed. In the, in the jungles, in camouflaging ourselves in the jungles and everything, all the guys with the mop of hair, they might stick out. The one bald guy might be able to fade in, you know, blend in somewhere. One in 12 or 8% will have male pattern baldness. Most significantly, of course, to this conversation, if every one of the 12 members of the hunt went out, did their part to contribute to the hunt, and had to take enough of a share to feed a whole family, there wouldn't be quite enough to go around. If one of those 12 was the gay uncle who had no kids, he only takes one portion of that hunt to feed himself. So that nature created this balance so that we could do things like hunt, see what's coming both directions, have the food that we hunt, make it for the whole tribe. You know what also occurs to me is that, obviously I can't know for sure because I wasn't there, but it does seem that part of this is the hypersexualization of this empire. 
where before if you're in a more tribal life yeah people were having sex but they weren't obsessed about it it wasn't like mm. you're a man you need to be out fucking 24 7. you're a woman you need to be all voluptuous and ready to go anytime the man wants and if you're not having sex four or five times a day there's something wrong with <laughs> you're <that>. a loser <laughs> those are the That's signs of an, of an empire though the hypersexualization yeah. of a yeah. culture is the signs of an imminent yeah. empire if you're the signs you're, of the end of an empire right. you're saying yes yeah. and so if you're out for instance, there's a show on National Geographic called um, Primal Survival. And one of the shows was these villagers that lived at the base of the Himalayas in China. And just watching what they would do and how they would live off the land. And I, my thought is, as I was watching this, I'm thinking, well, you're going out trying to sur not even survive. You're thriving. You're living. You're finding what you need to feed your family. And you're not consumed with who you're fucking or who's fucking who or whatever. And if it happens, it happens. Nobody's really concerned about it. It's just who you are as part of that tribe. But there's not the obsession with it that we have now. Well, um, another brilliant author is Jared Diamond. In 1994, he wrote a book called The Third Chimpanzee. That's us. We're the third chimpanzee. There's the, the standard chimp, the pygmy chimp, and the homo sapien. Those are, those are the three relatives. And he also wrote a book called Why is Sex Fun, which was an offshoot based on a chapter of that book. Um, Totally losing my point. Vulnerable monkeys, <laughs> women. No, it's coming off what you were saying. It was coming off what you were saying. It's it's about um, hypersexuality of an empire. Oh, of course, that is that we human beings, Homo sapiens, we have sex in private. There you no, go. seriously, that's a convention of who we are. So when we put it out on display. All of us, all automatically, there's going to be a little bit somewhere, some degree of an, oh, oh, I don't want I'm not supposed to see that. Now, people get fascinated with them. We become voyeuristic. And, oh, my God, I want to watch. Of course, because it's stimulating. But that doesn't mean it's healthy for, for our value system and for us to communicate and, and, and be in harmony and thrive. And it's, it's harder to have harmony when we're faced with, you know, knowledge about someone's sex stuff that's supposed to be private. If we... We are private sexual beings. We're one of the very, very few on this planet who have sex in private. But is that is That's that... the rule. You may do it in public, you're the exception. This being is a private sexual being. Is that also part of this culture though? Because if you think back to tribal, you didn't have individual rooms. So it's like a lot of times the parents would be having sex in the same single room where the kids were at and it was no big deal it was just mom and dad are doing what mom and dad do or it's the middle of the harvest so you're literally having sex in the middle of the field because you want to have sex under the harvest moon there wasn't that shame that we that western culture particularly and i think largely because of religion has attached to sexuality it's well, made us want to be close uh, well and also i think the shame comes in like you said it comes from the hypersexualization. Right. you know it comes from the public sexualization and it's not meant to be public so, in a way, I can almost understand why people get offended at any kind of sexual... I don't want to see that, you know, as the, as the attitude in general. And um, I, I, it does make some sense from that standpoint. And yet here we are. We're in this world and we're expressive and open and communicative. We want to be ourselves and we want to assert our individuality and, our, and what we feel to be our truth. And maybe what we're grappling with is how much room for that kind of hyper-freedom... And hyper-expression is there. Well, and, and I, I think it comes down to what we were talking about, this judging other people's happiness. I don't know how much sex you need or he needs or she needs or whoever needs. I know how much sex I need, and maybe it's not as much as somebody else needs. I don't need somebody judging me because I don't want to have a bunch of sex, and I'm not going to judge somebody else who wants to be having sex all the time either. This judging of other people's happiness and based on what we would like or dislike seems to be at, at part of the problem, this, this move, need to move beyond judgment. And that's a kind of a perfect little segue there. Look, the bottom line here, we've, we've been conditioned to do this and it's so easy to fall into the trap. We see something, we don't understand it, we, we understand a little tiny bit about it, and then immediately it frustrates us, so we resent it. And the antidote to that is to seek deeper understanding cultivate compassion for it so we can then put ourselves in that person's shoes and empathize with it and then we'll walk away with a wow good luck to you and a hug and an understanding instead of a resentment for you being who you 
happen to be. And at the end of the day, really ask yourself this question. What does, who, how does someone else making love to whoever they're making love to, how does that impact you negatively at all? Yeah. You know, why, why do you care? Why is that bothering you so much? It's something, yeah. it's not about the other person, it's about you. You need to look inside yourself and ask yourself, what in me is making me judge these yeah. people? Yeah, why, why am I filled with anger yeah. and hatred and resentment and, and judgment? And why, why aren't I tolerant? Why aren't I in harmony with my environment? Why can't I accept what is? This person is LGBTQ, I can't accept that. Why? Who taught me that? How did that get programmed in? And what do I want to be there? What do I want to be my response to the world? What, what skin do I want to live in? Right? What comfort level would I want to be at with the world if I could? If I could make a little effort and find more comfort, would I? That's for each of us to decide. And that's our perspective. I think it's a beautiful perspective. <laughs> it's a very loving perspective. <laughs> And so we'll sing you out now. <clears throat> and we'll always remember that after all, it's two, three, four. It is all a matter of perception. Where we stand in space and time. There is no you or me that I can see. Only to lose. Of the mind. See you next time. Thanks for joining us. See you next Thursday. Soul Perspectives. We love you. I like the moment I forgot my thought. I